My name is Alma Zalecki, and I'm the Director of Academic Affairs here at the New School and the coordinator of the Food Studies Program. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Food Studies Program's panel discussion on MFK Fisher, Poet of the Appetites. Before I introduce tonight's moderator, who will in turn introduce our guest speakers, I want to tell you a little bit about the Food Studies Program. As some of you know, the New School has offered a few courses in culinary history for years, but beginning with the spring 2008 semester, we began offering a full complement of courses in food history, culture, writing, business, and policy. Our aim with this new curriculum was to join the growing conversation on food production, distribution, quality, and taste that, judging by your presence here tonight, you've been following and participating in as well. We've recruited the mix of scholars and practitioners the new school is known for to teach our courses, and the response has been tremendous, both from the faculty and the students. Most of our fall full semester courses have already begun, but we still have a number of one-day workshops for food professionals open. And I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter and our spring catalog, which comes out in December, and will list all of our spring courses and events. We welcome your comments and suggestions, too, as informed members of this conversation, as we continue to develop our food studies and culinary history offerings in the future. And now on to our moderator. The moderator of tonight's panel is culinary historian, food writer, and member of the New School's Food Studies program, Andrew Smith. Andy is a prolific writer and frequent contributor to academic journals and popular magazines. He's the author of 16 books, including Peanuts, The Illustrious History of the Goober Pea, The Tomato in America, The Turkey, A Social History, and most recently, Hamburger, A Global History. Hamburger is one of the first books in the Edible series published by Reaction Books, for which Andy is the series editor. He's also the author of the Encyclopedia of Junk Food and Fast Food and the editor-in-chief of the Oxford Companion to American Food and Drink. Andy has taught culinary history courses at the New School for 13 years. In the summer, he launched our series on seminal figures in culinary history with a panel discussion titled Julia Child, Culinary Revolutionary. And I'm pleased to see that many of you who joined us for that event are here tonight as well. Tonight, he follows with our panel on MFK Fisher, and in the spring, a panel discussion on James Beard completes our first triptych of culinary luminaries. Watch your mailboxes for details on that and all our other public events at the New School. And now, please join me in welcoming Andy and our panelists. Thank you, Almaz. I just wanted to say that the hamburger book was a very difficult book to write. I had to go around and sample hamburgers around America and in other countries. And it was, of course, a tax deduction. So uh, all I can do is say it, there's value in writing about food uh, far beyond the intrinsic and the financial rewards that are there. Uh, in, in the world of uh, MFK uh, Fisher, there are exactly three types of people. One type of person reads anything that MFK Fisher ever wrote and immediately falls in love with her writing and falls in love with her and, and immediately begins picking up all the rest of the things that, uh, the books and articles that she's written and immediately uh, starts continuing uh, to read those. How many of you fall into that category? I know that, let's see your hands, nice and high. There's a second group of people that have not yet um, read anything or much by MFK Fisher um, and you're here because you're excited about the possibility of, of learning more about her. How many of you fall into that category? There's a third category uh, of people which uh, tried to read MFK Fisher and couldn't do it, tried over and over again. They're, they're slow learners. Um, I, I fall into that category, and maybe there's one or two of you out there. I tried very hard to read MFK Fisher over and over again, and I just couldn't do it. Two things had uh, a part, of, two things changed my life on that. The first was I read a wonderful book titled MFK Fisher, Julia Child, Alice Waters, Celebrating the Pleasures of the Table, written by one Joan Reardon, that gave me a wonderful introduction into, into um, MFK Fisher. And I needed that structure in order to be able to read her works. That's my mind working. The second thing was I started teaching writing, uh, food writing here at the New School. 
And as soon as you start teaching food writing, you start looking at the writing techniques of other authors, and particularly of MFK Fisher, and I fell in love with MFK Fisher at that point. So for those of you who fall into the, ca the final category, um, all I can do is say there is hope for you. Uh, as there was hope for me, I was saved, and you can be saved too. So I'm delighted to have this panel here. Uh, as I mentioned, Joan, uh, Dr. Joan Reardon has written actually several books, uh, one of which I've already mentioned, Poet of the Appetites, Life of MFK Fisher, is a wonderful biography. As far as I know, that's the definitive biography of MFK. There's other books out there, but they're not as good as yours. Um, and uh, I, she, we had Joan here for our Julia Child uh, symposium, and at that point, she was just in the final stages of publishing a book on MFK Fisher, uh, which uh, was MFK Fisher Among the Pots and Pans. I think we have copies of it back there? We do. Uh, now, we're changing this around. Now that she's talking about MFK Fisher, she's in the final stages of writing a book on Julia Child. So <laughs> we, we need to get back into the groove with you, Joan. Uh, but uh, we really thank you for coming at her own expense uh, from uh, Chicago, um, uh, uh, Illinois. And thank you very much for coming and joining us again. Joan. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And um, this is the centennial of MFK Fisher's birth in 1908. So this is a very special year, a very special time. Are we all right? A very special time. And I want to cover as much ground as I can. So I will be reading some of this. Since when I start to talk about MFK Fisher, I seemingly go on and on. I have always remembered Judith Jones' cautionary words. I'd rather read MFK Fisher than read about her. <laughs> so this evening, I'd like to address the differences between biography and autobiography. Because MFK Fisher was unremittingly autobiographical in her writing, and especially in major books like The Gastronomical Me, The Alphabet for Gourmets, Among Friends, Long Ago in France, Dubious Honors, and the posthumous trilogy, To Begin Again, Stay Me, Comfort Me, and Last House, she literally challenged biographers to tell her story at their peril. What separates biography from other kinds of storytelling is the fact that the characters are real. There is, in short, a texture of actuality that permeates the whole. M. F. K. Fisher, for so long, closely identified with California, actually was born on July 3rd, 1908, in Elbion, Michigan where her father was the editor of the evening newspaper. And the announcement of her birth appeared on July 3rd in the Albion Evening News. The way MFK Fisher told the story, is the way MFK Fisher told the story, she was born just minutes before the 4th of July and if she had been born on the 4th of July, her father had threatened to call her independencia. <laughs> Other facts that we know, and of course there are many. She married Al Fisher in September of 1929 and spent the next two and a half years of her life in Dijon. She had an adulterous affair with Dillwyn Parrish while married to Al Fisher. She was the mother of two daughters, and during her lifetime, she not only traveled to France at least 12 times, but also spent extended periods of time abroad. It is universally acknowledged that biographical information is based on fact. It is not the product of someone's imagination. And biographical forms are many, and they're varied. Autobiographies, memoirs, letters, diaries, journals are the most popular of these self-revealing texts. 
and they become invaluable sources for the biographer. But caution is always writ large. Autobiographies and memoirs are said to be monologues in which the subject shares with the reader what and exactly how much of his life he is willing to reveal. Even more restricted in scope and intent, memoirs, letters, diaries, and journals usually reveal a subject only at certain times and under certain circumstances. Take, for example, Long Ago in France by Fisher. It encompasses the comparatively short period of two and a half years that she spent in Dijon with her first husband. The memoir is self-contained and shares with the reader Mary Frances' growing appreciation of the Burgundian capital, her gradually acquired knowledge and appreciation of French food and wine, and how she made lasting friends with waiters, landladies, professors, and students whom she met during her residence in that ancient city. It is the highly personal explication of her gastronomical awakening in Dijon, as well as a vicarious tour of the city seen through the eyes of a sensitive narrator whose life is forever changed because of her residence there. For a biographer, memoirs like this one are a source, one of many, that provide an insight into the life of their author and it assumes importance as part of what Leon Edel called the warp and the woof, the crisscrossing threads that form the underside of a carpet and the clue to the flawless pattern of the whole figure in the carpet. As distinct from autobiographies and memoirs, biographies, therefore, can be considered dialogues in which the author enters into an ambiguous exchange with the subject in order to recreate a life. But evidence has it that some biographers or biographies require more than painting a stunning portrait. Depending upon their public personas, some subjects also need to be placed in the period in which they live. Spanning as it does all but 16 years of the 20th century, the life of Fisher travels distances as vast as Lady Baltimore cake to sushi from Joseph Wexberg's blue trout and black truffles to Ruth Reichel's tender at the bone from the settlement cookbook to Julia Child's The Way to Cook. MFK Fisher's writing provides an insight into the culinary world from the late 1930s until the early 90s. So culinary autobiographies and memoirs are very much in evidence today. But since Bruyere Savaron and the French tradition of personalized gastronomical writing and the early 20th century arbiters of food and wine, such as Alexis Lachine, Lucius Beebe and A.J. Liebling, and memoirists like Lu Ludwig Bemelmans and Samuel Chamberlain, there has been literally an explosion in the field of culinary memoirs. It's important, I think, to realize that beginning with M.F.K. Fisher in 1937 with her first book, Serveth Borth, autobiography and personal memoir plus her philosophy of the art of eating combined to perfect a hybrid genre. Whether she gently folded recipes into her narratives or simply explored the bliss or misfortune of family feasts, vegetable snobbism, the best oyster stew she ever ate, or learning to dine alone, she established the familiar I, myself pattern, which echoes through so much of our current food writing. The note of nostalgia or longing 
for an ideal past that can be symbolically repossessed by familiar foods, a note that pervades the most meaningful cookbooks, has certainly been given its fullest expression by her distinctive first-person style. And the unremitting use of gastronomy as a kind of surrogate to ease all human longing found its most varied expression in the stories that she told. But to her credit, she never attributed to food a dignity or power that it could not possess. Her highest praise for any dish, from bread and cheese to truffles, was to declare it good. On the eve of Mary Frances' 80th birthday, dubious honors the story of her writing career was published uh, by the North Point Press. Using 20 of her introductions to other people's books, as well as the introductions and revised introductions to her own books as a framework. She wrote of her pleasure and even reluctance to lend her name to others' work. Reconsidering such dubious honors gave, of course, the book its title. And because these introductions, two introductions, were arranged chronologically, they incidentally reflected her changing attitudes on a range of subjects. Tea, Japanese cooking, cooking great meals every day, and junior league cookbooks. It was in the introduction to part two, her own introductions, however, that she traced her development as a writer, acknowledging her debt to agents, editors, publishers, family and friends, who have served her well. In these pages, she provided necessary background and in many cases interpreted her own work. Mary Frances became the ultimate critic of MFK Fisher. She once said, uh, I think it was in 1949, that almost every gastronomer has some kind of literary predilection. MFK Fisher's election to the American Academy and National Institute of Arts and Letters in 1991, a year before she died, honored that predilection and secured her literary reputation. From a piece as fundamental as the anatomy of a recipe, to date, I really believe, the most compelling directive for clarity in a recipe, to stories like the kitchen allegory, with its overlay of personal sadness, Mary Frances wrote of the pleasures of the table like no other writer in the tradition of American letters. <clears throat> Memorial, memorialized in poetry, prose, and film since her death on June 22, 1992, Fisher continues to fascinate not only the culinary community but also those who have been caught in the web of her various personas. The oldest child, the boarding school ingenue, the young bride in Dijon, the lighthearted culinary historian, the Hollywood scriptwriter, the wife, mother, lover, grandmother, friend, and mentor. Is she a tempting subject for a biography? Oh, yes. And the material involved is tremendously vast. Uh, all of the places she lived, all of the people she knew, and of course, all of the writing that occupied her every day is there. It's available. The letters, the books, the magazine articles, the journals, the photos. Uh, it, is, it is a wealth of material. So is she a tempting subject for a biography? Yes. Will it be as satisfying as reading the gastronomical she? The answer is probably not.
Thank you, Joan. And also, thank you for introducing me to MFK Fisher. So I appreciate this for two things. Um, our second speaker is Judith Jones, who is uh, the senior editor and vice president at Alfred Knopf. She actually joined the staff at Alfred Knopf in 1957. She was two years old at the time. <laughs> a, a remarkable experience. Um, in addition to so many writers that she worked with, she did also work with MFK Fisher. She had a communication that went on, letters going back and forth for at least 25 years, um, and uh, was the uh, publisher and editor of at least five of MFK Fisher's books. So. file of letters that I had received from Mary Frances over 25 years and I started to read them and it, it, I just so entered into her life in reading them and it came to me why she was such an unusual writer. Uh, I selected readings from those letters, put them in an envelope, put them under my arm coming here, and they're somewhere between the subway and here. And I do apologize because I would love to share some of her own words with you. So I'll just have to sort of use my memory and give you a taste. But she entered so totally into the life and personality of the person that she was writing to, that I think that gives you a clue to her own writing. She just lived passionately and vicariously through other people in letters. Uh, we started corresponding several years before we ever met. I mean, I became her friend through these letters. And uh, the first time that we did meet, she was uh, still living in the Napa Valley then before she went to the last, last house. And it was a scorching hot day. And I was quite nervous about meeting her, this young editor and somebody I revered so. And she opened the door and said, come down to my cellar cafe. And we descended these dark steps and we were in the cellar and it was musty and sort of dirty, but this beautiful little table was set for lunch, a Provencal lunch, simple. I think it was probably some salad and some cheese. And it was an immediate meeting of three minds. My husband, Evan, was with us. And we knew, we just connected. And she always admired the House of Knopf, the way we produce books. and. I think wanted to come, but she had loyalties, and so she fulfilled those obligations, and then she was ready. And uh, as, you, as Aunt said, we did uh, five books together. Uh, the first one being about her life growing up in Whittier. And uh, I can't remember, she had a funny title for it, but uh, finally I came up with Among Friends, and she was eternally grateful just for the fact that I thought of a good title. And uh, her, her honoring of other people, her appreciation was, 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 was palpable. I think that's why she wanted to take care of you and feed you. Uh, and I, it's very fundamental to, she, she was never highfalutin about <coughs> cooking. Cooking was, expressing your friendship, your love for other people, and sharing. And her food was always very simple. Uh, so, as I said b before we met, I just started to send her some books that, that I had published. I think I'd read only uh, How to Cook a Wolf and admired her and thought these books were things that she would like. I remember one was by somebody named Janet Tessier du Croix who was a Scotswoman married to a Frenchman and lived all through the occupation in France. And it was a, a very quirky, wonderful book. Well, you can imagine. It touched Mary Frances in a way that, that she just 
was sort of burst with pleasure and gave me some wonderful quotes. And uh, I remember also sending her Mary, Mary Robles Henry, who worked at Vogue, and this book was called A Farmhouse in Provence. And she liked it, but she did say, uh, did you notice that whenever she puts her sweater over the back of a chair, it's cashmere? <laughs> uh, and then, of course, later, when I started doing food books, uh, she was so appreciative of Claudia Roden and of Jane Grigson, particularly, who wrote, first of all, a book on the art of charcuterie and a book on English food. And she finally went out to see Mary Frances when she was in, in uh, this country. And I wish I had that letter because she described how deliciously sort of plump she was and how she really wanted to pinch her. <laughs> I thought that was such a beautiful physical description. And it is that physicality that, that permeates all her writing. She was also endlessly curious. Uh, we had, we put trout in our pond up in Vermont and I remember one letter said, what are the trout gonna do in winter? And then I, I told her the story of how we had to kill the beaver. And she wanted to know what the beaver tasted like. And uh, there were several, oh, I remember when we got a little, a little uh, dog that she said, this particular kind of dog is atavistic. You're going to have trouble. And indeed, I would. I did have trouble. I used to have to take him to the greenery and, and Park Avenue for him to pee because he wouldn't do it any on a sidewalk in New York. I mean, there was something so perceptive about all these things, and I just relished them. And then the winter that Evan was quite ill, and then I had a threatening cancer that same year, and we both came out of it, but uh, she was she was the, the sympathy, the, the love that she expressed, the anger that this should happen to us was deeply, deeply moving to me. And as I say, I was really in tears reading these years of a great, great experience. Uh, I particularly remember when we went to Provence and she and her sister Nora were spending the winter there. And I we, we took my 90-year-old aunt and my mere 86-year-old mother with us. And I wrote to Mary Frances, said, do you, do you mind? They won't bother us. And uh, she said, indeed, I want to meet them. So sure enough, they did meet. And she was so infatuated with uh, my 90-year-old aunt, who looked rather like Virginia Woolf. And we went to a little restaurant in Marseille. And Mary Frances was watching this. My aunt was, had the, the end seat at the table, and she was sitting next to a terribly good-looking man. And when his, the first course was brought to him, she leaned over and said, that looks just like a Cezanne. And thereupon started a flirtation and <laughs> a conversation. <laughs> Mary Frances was just... So thrilled by that, I think in at least eight letters, she kept saying, I'll never forget that lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's how she entered so totally into our lives. And it was a wonderful working relationship. She happened to be a writer who hated to go back and look at what she'd done. And so you had to kind of coax her, and it wasn't always easy, but her her appreciation and uh, it's really the, the, the depth of her feeling as she entered into somebody else's life, to me, describes the quality of her writing. I don't think there's anyone like her. And food was just, it, don't forget that this was a point when food was not something we honored particularly in America. It was, you, you know, something that food was fodder, and you didn't talk about it, and you didn't make a fuss about it, or disguise it with sauces the way the French did. I'm 
supporting my, my English mother. But that was, that was and, it, and the poor little woman didn't want to spend time in the kitchen. So I think that she helped to awaken what was kind of a long suppressed desire in all of us to really enjoy the pleasures and the physicality of food and express them through friends, through other people. And I think that, that just permeated all of her writing and made it very, very special. Thank you. Uh, if you could send us, uh, send me a couple of the letters, and with your permission, and if we don't have any legal issues, we would love to put them up on the website uh, if we can. They're lost. Oh, they're lost entirely. They're the originals. Oh, we I had have to... picked uh, it's the whole file. Yeah. Okay. But I had picked about half a dozen that I wanted to read something from. I hope they turn up. Away from me. Does somebody know how to work Craigslist and can put a request out? To, it's sev several of the students here can handle that very easily. I hope that they come back. So I that's do a, have some copy, loads others, of others, yeah. but these okay. were the ones I that you liked. wanted to share with you. Uh, I did also, I forgot to mention, uh, Judith Jones is the author of The Tenth Muse, My Life and Food, a wonderful book, which we just happened to be selling in the back. So. Our next speaker is Amanda Hesser. Amanda has worked at the New York Times as a food columnist and editor for over 10 years. She is the author, in my opinion, of several, well, she's, excuse me, she's the author of several books. Two of them are wonderful. Uh, the Cook and the Gardener and Cooking for Mr. Latte. It is nothing negative about the other books. It's simply that those two books I, I loved. Um, and she is the author of an upcoming book, soon to be out in November, Eat Memory, The Great Writers at the Table, of which has been appearing, as I understand it, in um, short form in the New York Times Magazine. Yeah, so it's, uh, I, we look forward to that. We'd hoped that we could have been selling that today, but they wouldn't give us advanced copies on that. As far as I know of the panelists, you're the only one never to have met MFK Fisher in person, but you know her through her writing. So that's great, Amanda. Um, quick, I just wanted to make a note about something that uh, Judith said about how Aunt, uh, Mary Frances didn't like to look back at her own writing, and I don't know—I don't remember where she wrote this or said this, but it, it apparently made her nauseous <laughs> um, to actually. Oops. Okay, like that. All right. Um, so um, I come to this panel with, you know, much uh, less expertise and um, experience with Mary Frances than. Um, everyone else here. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm more of a longtime admirer uh, of her work, and I've written about her a few times. So I thought um, I'd use this time to um, talk about some topics that maybe we can you know, talk about later. Um, probably like many food writers, I would credit MFK Fisher with luring me to the profession. Um, you know, I read a lot of her work in college, and to me, her life seems so perfect. Uh, she, you know, living in France and traveling by steamship to Europe and having these endless meals. And I seem to remember there were a lot of afternoon naps. Um, and that, <laughs> that appealed to me a lot. And um, the, the problem was, um, which I'm you know, sure many other writers who were, you know, uh, equally seduced by her writing is that you know it's easy to become a food writer. It's not so easy to write as well as MFK Fisher. Um, and you know one of the things that has surprised me most about her writing is how you can really kind of go back to it again and again over the years, which I have done, and uh, your relationship to it changes so much. Um, like I said, when I was in college, I was you know. I was smitten by the lifestyle and her use of language. You know, her writing is very at atmospheric. Um, but now, many years later, I'm much more interested in her as, um, you know, as, as a woman and a mother, and um, the motivations behind her writing. She, uh, many of you may know this, but she lived uh, in more than 20 homes or places uh, in her adult life. She was married three times, had two children, and lived through World War II. So although um, 
there is something kind of like magical about her lifestyle, she certainly didn't have an easy life. And, you know, sometimes I, I read her work now and I think, you know, where's the babysitter? Um, <laughs> how did she manage to raise her children, you know, largely on her own and write all this great work too? Um, and I wonder, you know, why she moved so often. You know, was she, what was she escaping from? And there's sometimes the sense that she, she craved discomfort and uncertainty. Um, and it makes her writing all the more interesting when you start thinking about it in these, in these terms. Um, another thing I, I, you know, I think is sort of worth um, maybe touching on tonight is that, you know, she set such a high standard for writing and you, I sort of wonder um, if anyone will ever match her. And, you know, there, there is great writing now, of course, and I would point to people like Bill Buford for that, um, but things are so different now. And one of the things that Mary Frances benefited from was that she wrote about places that most of her readers hadn't been to. Um, you know, at the time, France was extremely foreign, and I would even use the word exotic. Um, and she really brought it to life for people. And, you know, now everyone has been everywhere and has tasted everything. So it's hard to evoke a place and kind of capture the imagination uh, of people when they can have it themselves. Um, and I'm not saying <laughs> that um, Mary Frances only succeeded because of her time. I, because I think if she were alive today and a writer today, she would be you know, just as wonderful as she was then. Um, and maybe she would be the world's best food blogger. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think that there's something about the confluence of her writing and the era that you know she lived um, in that makes her collection um, even more worth cherishing. Our fourth speaker is Kennedy Golden, Associate Dean of Students at Mills College. Uh, and daughter of MFK Fisher. I want you to know, Kennedy, we actually have a number of things in common. We were born within months of each other, not far from each other, you in Pasadena and I in beautiful downtown sunny Burbank. <laughs> uh, we lived both in Southern California for a while, and when you uh, started teaching at Mills, I actually taught at Dominican College in San Rafael, so across the bay. Uh, where we differ is that you ate wonderful French food and wonderful <laughs> food from your mother for your entire, uh, much of your life. Uh, I ate the three M's, uh, mac and cheese, meatloaf, and McDonald's. So I think you um, had a wonderful childhood, and uh, we all wish we could have been with you. Kennedy. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the New School and Andrew Smith and Pamela Tillis for inviting me here to be on this panel today. Um, it's a real honor to have a public way to celebrate my mother's hundredth, what would have been my mother's hundredth year, and to be with such illustrious panelists. Um, and there are a few myths that I might dispel along the way. Um, the wonderful food, um, yes, we did eat well. We always ate well. We always ate simply. Um, and the idyllic childhood that many people choose to believe we had may not always have been so idyllic, but I don't wish to dispel great stories, so hold on to those thoughts. Um, I come not as an author, not as a critic, but simply as a daughter. I'm a daughter of an amazing woman who lived a, a tremendously exciting and wonderful life. I came into her life when she was 38, and she had already published a number of books. Those first 38 years were filled with loss, love, excitement, travel, husbands, a daughter, many things, um, and then I came along. And um, there was a break between when she, in 1943, she had published five books and my sister was born. And then she waited for a little while. And I think that's because um, when she met my father, Donald Frieda, who actually lived across the street from the new school for a number of years, um, life took another amazing change. And they left, she had come to New York, and they left New York after a whirlwind romance that you may have read about in books, biographies, and such. And they went to the desolate California, Southern California hills in Hemet, California, where I spent 
I don't know, I think something like the first three years of my life. I, Joan actually knows more than I do about that because <laughs> quite frankly, I wasn't there. I was just being a kid. Um, but that was a really hard time for her to have two small children and a husband who um, was quite social, quite active, had lived a vibrant life of his own, and they had a three-party line and lived up a dusty road with blowing tumbleweeds in the desert. Um, not exactly what, what they were used to, and they had these two small children. And so in 1947, one year after I was born, she published um, Not Now But Now, which I think is quite an intriguing title at that point in my life, because I think she was questioning many, many things. And two years later, she, pub she did the translation of Bria Savarin, which is so well known, and also the alphabet for gourmets. So how she did that on that desolate piece of desert in the hills with the tumbleweeds and two small children, I have no idea. <laughs> and it certainly wasn't anything that we ever talked about, unfortunately. I would, I would really like to be able to ask her that question at this point. Um, I think, I know there were financial challenges and so forth, but um, wow, that was quite a start for me, those, those first few years, and I was unaware. We moved from Bear Acres, which was the name of the place where we were living, um, to Whittier, California, where her father was editor of the Whittier News. And uh, we lived in a wonderful house on Painter Avenue, which is now a wading pond in a park that says Kennedy Park. And most of the people who go there think it's a different Kennedy than Rex <laughs> Brenton Kennedy, who was my grandfather. Um, and that doesn't really matter, because they can enjoy it. Um, I, I was thinking tonight about what what you all would want to hear, what would you like to hear, what do you want to know? And so my first thought was to go book by book, where we were, what we were eating. There were too many books, I couldn't do it. Um, so I thought I would just touch on a couple of little, a couple of little place, places, culinary places, family places, and recollections that I have, because that's, that's all I can do. Um, when we were in Whittier, her father was very ill, and finally her her father, her mother, and then her father passed away. And uh, my recollection of the house in Whittier, uh, which we left when I was seven years old, was of thick slices of brown bread with egg yolk and brown sugar on them as we went out the door to play in the morning. And a couple of occasions where we had special waffle breakfasts with the waffle iron uh, cord with strings hanging down from it so that nobody would trip over it uh, out on the side porch and my, and my grandfather presiding in the first formal dining room that I think I ever really experienced. Um, when he died, we, my mother moved north and we went up toward the Napa Valley. I think it reminded her of her home in Switzerland with, with Dillwyn Parish. Um, indeed, the Napa Valley has a lot in common with, with some of the places she had lived earlier where she was extremely happy. The trip, however, from Whittier up to St. Helena it, by car was one that I'll never forget, and it has been written about by my mother, so you may know it um, a little differently than I remember it. We stayed in a motel, my mother, my sister, and me. Uh, my sister had a puppet that was her friend, and I had a small stuffed dog, and those were our security blankets that we actually carried many places in our lives because we traveled all over the place. And um, my fondest recollection is not of the man on the pier that you may all have known or some of you may read about, but rather sitting on a sand dune with my mother eating the best, grittiest hamburger in the world um, because we were, the three of us were together and we were going to a new place and we were very excited. And there was a big wind and there was a lot of sand in that hamburger, but boy, it was good. Um, we got to St. Helena, and that became our base for many years. Um, we came and we went, um, and some of those years were very challenging for, you know, I mean, I went through adolescence in that town, and that was the challenge. Um, and one of the places that we went to leave St. Helena was to Aix-en-Provence, which provided fodder for a number of books, um, and needless to say, some incredible memories. Um, and I'm excited to say that the family continues some of those memories um, in that my aunt, who's 91, and her son, and her grandson, who's with us today, and uh, their daughter, Sachi, uh, just returned from being an ex for two weeks. 
And so my aunt said it was an absolutely amazing, amazing trip, and she's really glad that she made it. So um, I look forward to reading about Aix en Provence now, some many years later. Um, when we were in Aix, we lived uh, simply, we lived in pension. For some reason, I don't, this must be a family trait. She put the two of us in one pension, and she was across town in another pension. And I guess maybe that was the way we were supposed to learn French, and indeed we did. It was sort of the sink or swim model. Um, and when we became articulate enough, um, we moved into the pension with her. And that was Madame Lanz. She's written about it. It's, it, was a, it was a fun place. We had a great time. Um, we spent many, many, many t hours at the De Garçon on the Cour eating lemon sorbet. Um, we had many wonderful restaurant experiences and indeed um, she befriended everybody in the restaurant as she did every taxi driver and every doorman that I think we ever encountered, um, much to our embarrassment at that point. Mm -hmm. However, I must say that that seems to be a family trait because I do the same thing and so does my son. So <laughs> what can I say? Um, from X, we moved out to La Tolonay, and we lived above the stables um, at the chateau, which was lived in by one little old lady at that point. Um, and it was probably the most idyllic time that we ever spent. Uh, we wandered in the hills with the shepherd. We ate fresh food, fresh fruit, fresh vegetables under the trees. We waited for the, the different trucks to come on different days with fish or produce or whatever. Um, I have amazing memories of that. And my aunt just returned to La Tolonay and said, it's quite different now. And they had a lovely lunch in a, in a spot where we, we ate quite frequently. Uh, we returned then to San Francisco where she thought it would be fun to raise her two daughters for a short period of time. And we had also brought back Monique Widnov, who was the daughter of one of the pension owners where we had lived. And we spent about three months, three months? <laughs> Don't? Um, in San Francisco. More like six, okay. Three, six. Um, and she had a, a fantasy that San Francisco would be a wonderful place to live and discovered rather rapidly that it was not a wonderful place to live with three young girls. And so we moved on to back to the Napa Valley. And at that point, um, she bought a house, that, the house that Judith Jones was speaking of with the wonderful basement. And that was, that was home for many, many years. But it didn't stop us from leaving town again. Uh, we went back to Europe, went to Lugano in Switzerland. Again, we went to a school, and she went to a pension. I'm not quite sure what that was about, except we did learn to speak Italian. That was good. Um, but before we went into school, and she went to her pension, um, probably the one time that we recognized my mother as an author, um, and the one time, pretty much for the rest of her life also, it was not a topic for us of conversation, but she was so excited because she had just had A Cordial Water published by Little Brown, and the way she celebrated was to buy both of us brown suede coats, <laughs> which we thought was pretty cool. Um, we stayed in Lugano for a while, and then we went back to X when she was, she was not well. We didn't really understand what was going on. Um, we lived in a hotel for many months, and we would join her for lunch after school, um, having wonderful meals on the Cour again, and taking side trips all over the place, which I found to be incredibly annoying at that particular age. I really wish that I had a little more recollection of all of them because I know that we went fantastic places and we probably ate delicious food and I don't know what we did but it was I look back on it now and go wow that must have been quite something um, the one thing I do remember is we often traveled to Marseille by bus and we spent a good amount of time and, and she's written about it uh, right on the port and and spending time in Marseille which was a somewhat frightening but very exciting place to be we then came back to the house in St. Helena, and the basement was our um, sanctuary. The valley is really, really hot, and she had bought a Victorian house that had a basement that was halfway underground, sort of like some of the houses around here. And she 
the one thing that she was able to do financially was to rebuild the foundation of that house so that it, it still stands today. If she hadn't been able to do that, I think they would have had to tear it down. But that basement, which was dug by Chinese workers way back, um, was a sanctuary. And the little, the little room with the table was a place where we spent many, many hours. Right past that little room was a, another long room that had uh, twin beds right next to the foundation. And that's where we spent many, many, many nights. And my mother would get up at, well, 3 o'clock in the morning and walk about six feet away from the head of my bed and start typing and on a typewriter, uh, which was noisy. Um, but that, to this day, the sound of a typewriter sort of lulls me to sleep. Um, when, when it was cool enough, we, we'd move upstairs, and my bedroom was right next to the kitchen. And rather than hear the typing, what I would hear was uh, Fats Waller or Jelly Roll Morton at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, at that point in my life, they really weren't my favorites. But now, now I like it. Um, she always had a home that was open to many. Um, her friends, the friends she made through correspondence, people she wrote back and forth with for years came to visit her pretty much no matter where she was. And um, they shared food and they shared conversation um, everywhere up to, up to the very end when she moved into Last House, which was her house in the Sonoma Valley. Um, there was an endless stream of people who came and visited her. Uh, when she was no longer able to speak, she could hear perfectly well. And you could tell that she was completely engaged in the conversations that were happening. Um, she really liked it when two people came to visit. My Aunt Nora and I went every Wednesday. And we would gather, and the two of us would talk. And we would talk about what was going on in our lives and what was going on, you know, memories. And Nora would share recollections of times that we had spent together. And, and it was one, and my mother's eyes were just twinkling. She, she couldn't articulate, we couldn't understand what she was saying from the Parkinson's, but she was so clearly present, it was amazing. Um, there were 14 books after she went back to St. Helena. I tried to keep track of all of them in, in the last few weeks when I knew that I was coming here and I would look at the bibliographies in the back of her published works and think, I, I, I can't go there. Um, because really, I didn't know her in her books. I'm in her books, she's, you know, she really is so autobiographical in her work. Um, she told a great story. Sometimes my recollections were a little bit different, um, as happens. But in, in the years before she moved, be, before she was ill, when I was an adult growing up and had a family, we gathered for celebrations, for birthdays, for Christmas, um, and I, I think fondly of a holiday celebration in, uh, in Saint, no, in, at Last House, where my son was small and she wanted to do something special for him. And so we arrived at the house on Christmas Eve Eve, which was the night that we came to celebrate with her. And she had a green Provencal salad bowl that was pretty battered. It had, we'd had it since, she'd had it since the 50s. Um, I hate to think of what lead compounds it may have had in it, but it didn't matter. Um, and she, she had put lots of little wrapped trinkets into this thing, and she had decided that the bamboo toaster lift, toast lifter would be a good thing to use to pick up these trinkets to unwrap them one by one. And it became, it was not an easy thing to do, um, but it was so much fun. And we laughed and we talked and, and being with her, you didn't, when you were with her, you were with her. You didn't stray, you didn't go off and read a book or something, even as her daughter. We just sat and talked for hours. Um, and that continued as she um, was honored many times in San Francisco. She did a couple of guest engagements um, for the San, to benefit the San Francisco Public Library. And she often was, would stay at the Stanford Court Hotel because Jim Nasikas, who owned it, was a friend of hers. And if he had some opening, he'd say, come on down. And she would come down with somebody who she needed to have travel with her, and he would put them up in wonderful corner suite. And she would always take the floral bouquets apart, which I thought was just outrageous. 
um, and, and pool the drinking glasses. And this was a, a thing that she did with, with great pleasure, you know, huge floral arrangements. And there would be little posies everywhere. And she would send people home with posies with these glasses from the Stanford court. Nobody ever called her on it. And uh, you know, she enjoyed it. And I think my, my most vivid food memory of the Stanford court and my mother, it really, those were fun days, um, was a caviar tasting. There was a caviar tasting Sorry. with many food dignitaries and lots of press and so forth. And, she was rather frail at that point, and they were trying to be extremely gracious. And, and somebody came up to her as they were photographers all over the place with this mound of caviar that just went on for about 10 feet. And they said, you know, what can we get you? And she said, a large spoon. <laughs> so um, yeah, she, she was an amazing woman. Why, why we moved around as much as we did, I have no idea. We didn't really ever talk about it because it was just what we did. Um, you know, people have asked me, how was it to be her daughter? And my response is, I don't, didn't know anything else, so I really can't comment on that. Um, but she was an amazing woman, and I, I truly appreciate Joan's work with the biography. I know it was a labor of love. We spent many hours looking at photographs and talking. Um, and I appreciate the fact that 100 years after her birth and 16 years after her death, we're all sitting here in this room because of her. So I want to thank you all for being here, for giving me an opportunity to walk that road again. And to, to reread, I also recently found some letters of hers and have spent some time rereading them. And it was a true gift. I might not have done it if I weren't coming tonight. So thank you all very much. We have time for some questions, and we have a microphone in the back, so if you could just raise your hand, go right here. Um, first, I, I, I want to thank um, M.K. Fisher for bringing me to France when I was 20 years old and had a lot of loss and lived in Arles, and I mean, I'm going to cry now, but went to X and Marseille, and I followed the entire book, and, and she brought food to me um, in the most essential way possible. So she's always in my heart. Um, I wanted to ask, I guess, the two people who did experience, um, what was it like to watch her cook, to actually go to market and to cook a meal? The question, if you didn't hear it, was what it was like to watch MFK Fisher cook? Uh, I spent time with, uh, with Mary Frances uh, when she was 79 uh, years old. And what struck me as, I, I think I probably have the dubious distinction of having put uh, some potatoes that she was going to make a chowder out of. Uh, down the disposal because I just <laughs> I just saw these potatoes in the sink and I thought uh oh you know and I was tidying things up a little bit and so they went into the disposal but the, the point I'm trying to make is that is that when I knew uh, Mary Frances she did her prep work um, very early in the day and if it, you know she was going to make a chowder, I mean this was going to be the the main the main course. Um, her 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 meals were very simple, and she would would do the preparation very early in the day so that she could spend time with her guests, and that was the case with with many many things. I mean. She served food at room temp. I mean, she wasn't bustling around in the kitchen, you know, making something when her guests uh, were present. And so uh, she, she did have a very distinctive personal style of cooking and serving. And the emphasis was always on the serving and the enjoyment of the meal and the conversation at the meal. I would have to totally agree with you. Um, very few people actually saw her cook. And many, many people have asked me, you know, if I have a photograph of 
myself in the kitchen with her when she, I was five or seven or nine, and I said no, because I didn't pay any attention to it. But absolutely, the, the emphasis was on the presentation and on being with the people. It was about sharing food. It, um, I think she had an absolute passion uh, for handling vegetables. And she loved vegetables and fresh fruit. And to this day, I, I laugh because I'm not as good with vegetables, but fruit, um, there's something absolutely healing for me to be working with the fruit of the land. And I think that that was also the case with her. And that was her contemplative time. Chia? So, in her work, did she discuss her pets? her cat and her dog. <laughs> and yet, I am left with a very strong sense of her and the relationship he ha she had with her animals. Can you tell me a little more about that? <laughs> well, what I can tell you is because she traveled so much, because we traveled so much, she had a great succession of animals. Um, we had many previously owned pets, and many people became owners of pets when we left town. <laughs> Um, and, you know, she always made good homes, made sure that they had good homes. She had many good cats. Many of you may have read about Blackberry out at Hemet. Um, she had a great fondness for animals. Um, but she also realized that they were, that life was transitory. And she was not into worrying about the fact that, you know, you have a dog and you're leaving town, you find a home for it, you come back, get another dog. Um, but we talked, we had, a, we had a, a, sh a waiter at one of the restaurants in San Francisco that we attended regularly, and he gave us a Siamese cat that, for whatever reason, I can't remember why Bob gave us that cat, but he did. And we had that cat for a long time. She was a, a very, very kind and gentle pet, pet owner, um, and I think that they added greatly to her life, but for brief periods of time. The boss dog. The boss dog was, again, an animal who was in our life for a brief period of time at a restaurant in X when we were kids. Uh, the boss dog absolutely existed. Um, the experiences with the boss dog absolutely happened. I was there. I remember those. Um, the boss dog, I think, was very much like the waiters and the taxi cab drivers. You know, it was a, a very intense and brief relationship that she had with the boss dog. Also, in culinary history, I mean, uh, Mary Frances was, was certainly acquainted with Mrs. Beaton's book of household management and mm -hmm. so forth. And in those comprehensive British um, proscriptive types of, of household books, they did have whole sections, you know, on the care of, of animals. And, and I think, uh, again, Mary Frances was was, uh, you know, acquainted with that tradition, and that was, you know, one of her concerns. And also, she does quite a bit, you know, about animals in the cordial water. But um, I, again, this is a personal reminiscence of when, when I first uh, uh, met Mary Frances at Last House, we were sort of getting acquainted, and I think we were talking about pets. And I opened my wallet because I had a picture of our Airedale. And I was about to take it out and show it to Mary Frances, and she said, oh dear, you're not going to start crying, are you? <laughs> I mean, it was, I mean, she thought, you know, that this, was pro this Airedale was possibly deceased, and it, this was going to bring about this flood of tears. But um, it, it, uh, it, it, she, and I still remember Zazi and, uh, these two calico cats that were forever sort of flying around in the air and they would land on your shoulder or something and, you know, you were being polite and so forth. But I al always wondered, you know, just exactly, you know, it, if the teeth would land somewhere. You know. We had a, a wonderful dog, a Pekingese, for a brief period of time in one of our stints in St. Lena. And um, as a previously owned dog came to us with no name and she decided that we would call it Yi. So we could call it either Yeeful Gleeful, or we could go out in the street and say, hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> Other questions? I, 
Thank you all for coming. Joan will, uh, is, was, is, I've twisted her arm. She is willing to autograph books that happen to be sold in the back. It's, it's, it's been really hard to get her to that point, but she's willing to do it. And I want to thank all of our three panel, or our four panelists, three of whom are here. Thank you very much. Thank you.